you realize that there isn't much of an understanding of what it actually is, that it is not just one system across all of the Gulf states. To give you a background, all of the Gulf states, Lebanon, Jordan, they all follow a version of kafala. Now, the kafala is basically, it's a way in which you invite guests into the country. And you will see in many literature that they refer to migrant workers as guest workers as well. It's kind of linked to how kafala was initially conceived. The kafala system is not the labor law. It is the immigration system. It is what's governed by the Ministry of Interior or the counterpart. So in different countries, they're called different things. So it's a Ministry of Interior, the policing wing of the government that handles kafala. Whereas labor law is under the Ministry of Labor or the Ministry of Manpower. So these are two separate systems. As a worker, when you come in to any of these countries, your entry at the very outset is through this immigration system of kafala, and then you are governed by the labor law, except for domestic workers, we'll come back to it. Everyone who comes into these countries comes under the kafala law, either as a worker or as a spouse or as a child. In all of the Gulf countries, the main kafil, that is the person, the sponsor under the kafala system, is a national. The only exceptions are those who employ domestic workers, and in most of the countries, family visas, so I, as a wife, if I'm going in, my husband is my kafir. We understand that some countries, the company becomes the sponsor, but in general, it is the family itself. That's the only exception where non-nationals are allowed to be sponsors. As I said, this is not the labor law. But the problem with the kafala is that the person who's sponsoring you under the kafala and the person who's employing you under the labor law is an individual. It's the same person. And nine out of 10 times, it's a national. Now, that is where a lot of the problems arise, right? Because it's an individual who decides on your residency, the way you live there, or whom you can bring in, how you can live there. And the same individual decides what kind of work you do, how you work, what kind of money you get. It's really unbelievable power rested in one person. Each of these countries have versions of a kafala. The most oppressive provisions of the kafala is that you can't leave the country without your kafil, that is your sponsor's permission. And two, that you cannot change jobs without your sponsor's permission. Apart from this, you can't really do most things without your kafil's permission. If you want to get a driving license, if you want to open a bank account, if you want to get a loan, everything, or if you want to bring your family in, basically every movement, every single freedom is attached to that kafil. So everything is linked to that kafil and that person in most places. If you have a problem with an employer, that doesn't really threaten or influence everything else in your life. Your job is at a risk, but your living conditions and all of that is more or less protected because that's a separate system, right? Your residency. That is not available here in the Gulf countries. And another really uh, important part of the uh, kafala is that you, um, you do not have the ability or the right to renew your own papers. So while the labor card or your work permit is being renewed by the employer, even your residency is done by your employer, by your sponsor, which means you don't even know when it's being renewed. You don't know when your contract has been renewed. And these are all uh, aspects when you want to leave the country or you want to quit a job, you don't have control over what they have done with your residency status. But if they fail to renew your residency visa, your ID card, the worker, the, the resident is the one who's criminalized, not the kafil. So the responsibility for renewal lies on the kafil. The criminalization when that doesn't happen is on the worker. So this is how provisions of the kafala affect individuals there. Uh, I want to quickly look at how the kafala system affects domestic workers the most. Because domestic workers, while all of these countries now have introduced some kind of regulations, they are not included in the labor law. They all either have a separate regulation or domestic workers law. Their main governance continues to be the Ministry of Interior. That again is the policing wing of the government, is the one that also takes care of the welfare of the domestic worker. Now, this is a very tricky thing because then when you have a problem, 
the person you have to complain to is the person you fear most. Because domestic workers, one of the ways in which that they can escape an abusive situation is if they leave the employer. And the minute they leave the employer, because of the isolation they work in, they are probably leaving with the help of someone else that they trust, rightly or wrongly, and their status immediately becomes irregular. They have an absconding or runaway case against them. It doesn't matter the reason why they do it, that they do it itself is criminalized by law. Now, for domestic workers, then they have to go reach out to the police. And that is a key part of kafala on why it is so exploitative. People under the labor law still have remedial mechanisms and redressal mechanisms. They have slightly better access to justice. Um, at least they have systems that they can reach out to. For domestic workers, that's not there. A couple more things that Bonnie mentioned that I just wanted to, to really highlight because they are the most kind of egregious components of the kafala system. So as Bonnie mentioned, if any worker leaves their place of employment uh, without permission, either permission from their employer or in certain circumstances, which I'll go into detail later, it has been become a bit easier for some workers under certain circumstances to transfer without their employer's permission. But in general, one of the most powerful tools that a kafil or an employer has over their worker is their ability to lodge an absconding charge against a worker. And these absconding charges are incredibly misused. So for example, if a worker complains or asks for a higher salary or asks for the salary that they were promised, or for whatever reason, the employer can lodge an absconding charge against them. And this charge essentially immediately makes them irregular. And it makes them subject to detention, deportation. The fines for absconding from your employer are very high. And so while um, Saudi and Qatar in some instances are the only two countries which have an official exit permit, if you have an absconding charge against you, you can't leave the country. And so this is really abused by employers. Employers might use absconding charges for a number of other reasons as well. Like if they just don't feel like paying for the renewal of their, their visas, if they're just annoyed with the employer, there's really like nothing that that will prevent an employer from charging a worker with absconding. Only recently have a couple of countries started to introduce a few monitoring mechanisms which will hold the employer accountable if these charges are made without valid reasons. But in general, what we see with all aspects of the kafala system is that you get disproportionate power is given to the employer. And at the same time, the employer is given complete impunity. Um, so if they violate their obligations under the employer's contract, if they violate their obligations as the kafil, you will rarely ever see them really truly held accountable for what they have done, even though the laws do list penalties for you know, not getting a visa on time, not renewing a visa, etc., not paying. And so I, I guess just from there, we'll move on to the common misconceptions that we've heard from people regarding the kafala. The first is that the kafala is based on Islamic law. It has had a long background in the region. It really started in the colonial time. It had, I think, kind of better intentions, perhaps in the early 20th century. And now it's really morphed into this way for states to sort of delegate authority over their very large migration population to individual nationals. So it has no basis in Islamic law, and so that is not a barrier for it to be overturned. The kafala is not, also not a single law. There have been some countries that did have you know, a specific law that said this is a sponsorship law, but the kafala system is really a system. It's a number of laws that sort of intersect with each other. Last Lastly, one common thing we hear is that Qatar and Bahrain have abolished the kafala system. Unfortunately, we tend to hear this from people in Qatar and Bahrain as well. It's just, it's simply not true. It's really good PR, but they have not abolished the kafala system. Qatar has kind of reworded, you know, dropped the word like sponsorship from the law. Bahrain also did something similar in 2012. But in reality, the main contours of the system still exist and the most egregious aspects of the system do still exist as well.